A very good evening to one and all present. I, on behalf of Study Circle, I welcome you to the 89th meeting. For today's session, we have a second of the lecture series conducted by Mr. G. Ashok Pati, Advocate, Advocate Metas High Court, and an arbitrator. The topic for which is Art of Arbitration, and this is the part two of it. I now invite Mr. Siva Shanmugam, Advocate in the Metas High Court, to give the welcome address and a brief introduction of the speaker. Good evening and welcome you all to the second edition of the Art of Arbitration to be given by our good friend Mr. G. Ashoka Bhatti, who is well known and I think is gaining popularity now in view of the YouTube videos also. I don't want to stand between you and the wonderful lecture. Welcome you all. Thank you. Uh, good evening, one, one and all. Uh, no doubt. Uh, Siva is at his best of his sarcasm today. <coughs> well, friends, uh, it's a good evening. And uh, we'll start off uh, with our lecture series. And uh, in the last session, we went through with respect to how uh, the proceedings can be initiated, how an arbitration proceedings can be initiated, and uh, what are the disputes that can be arbitrable. These are the important aspects that we discussed in the previous session. Now, if you see the match, how it goes is, first we find out where we can start, then what are the disputes, and then now the disputes are ready for being resolved. So what we need is the resolver, namely the arbitrator. Now, who will see first who the arbitrator can be? At the outset, it is interesting to see that the act does not define the term arbitrator at all. Instead, in, in section 11 of the Arbitration Conciliation Act, it would state that a person of any nationality may be an arbitrator. So what has been said is who can be an arbitrator and not who is an arbitrator. So in that way, if we say we have to now indulge into the aspect of who can be an arbitrator. Though the section 11 says that any person of any nationality can be an arbitrator, in reality, there are certain other clauses which have to be considered to see if this is such an open clause. Section 211A, I think, has to be read along with this, where it says that a person who is appointed as an arbitrator shall not have any direct or indirect past or present relationship with the parties or the subject matter in dispute. This is one of the important crux of it where the independence and impartiality of an arbitrator is to be disclosed by the arbitrator. So if a person who has all these aspects, that is he is directly connected with, it, with the dispute or with the parties or indirectly connected with the dispute or with the parties or financially he is interested or it is part of his business, then he cannot sit as an arbitrator. So can I say that only this is the only restriction that has been brought in? There would be another one also from the inception of the act and even prior to that under the 1940 act. Namely, the party, the arbitrator should be a person who is capable of being entering into a contract. In other words, an unsound mind, a, per, a minor, an insolvent cannot be an arbitrator. Though this is not found in the ambit of the act or spelled out in the statute, it is the aspect which has been recognized from long before, and it is in practice in judicial precedence also. Now, this was the law till 19, 2015. In 2015, the act sought to be enacted with two schedules, namely Schedule 5 and Schedule 7. I would only say that the elig ineligibility is mentioned only in Schedule 7. Schedule 5 has no relevance with respect to the appointment of, of arbitrator. This is my humble opinion. If you go through section uh, Schedule 7, who are the arbitrators who are not, who are considered to be ineligible has been spelled out. I would definitely not go into the entire list of it. Reading out would be only a time consuming aspect. I would only say the headings, that is namely the titles in which these relationship concerns of, namely the arbitrator's relationship with the parties or the council is one of the relationship which is 
found to be ineligible. Second is the relationship of the arbitrator to the dispute. If he is some way related to the dispute, then he cannot be an arbitrator. An arbitrator's direct or indirect interest in the dispute, again, this is not permitted. Apart from these three types of people, others are not ineligible to be an arbitrator. Now, interestingly, in 2019, there was another amendment, namely Schedule 8 was brought into the Arbitration Conciliation Act. Friends, what we need to consider here is, while bringing in all these amendments, in none of the clause, it has been stated that this clause is notwithstanding Section 11, where it says any person of any nationality can be an arbitrator. A person of any nationality can be an arbitrator has been mentioned in Section 11, though there have been so many uh, restrictions which are brought in subsequently, but none of these uh, enactment talk saying that the Section 11 will not apply to this or it is notwithstanding Section 11, these amendments are being, there's no uh, clause to that effect. Now, Section 8, when it has been brought in, it brought in certain qualifications and experience that an arbitrator should process. This was brought in with the help of, with the intention of having more expertise knowledge for an arbitrator and to control and convey a better meaning to the act and the process. <clears throat> what was important here is the draft itself would state that it has been drafted and incorporated to include so many other people who are not in the legal fraternity directly to be made as an arbitrator. It includes advocates who have a practice of 10 years and above, chartered accountants, cost accountants, company secretaries, Indian legal services, officers with law degree in having 10 years of experience in government and autonomous body, public sector units, a person of engineering degree, but who has been an, uh, in the government for government or autonomous body or public sector unit, such other persons, it keeps on going. So in principle, they are all government officials or others who are some way connected with some activity in arbitration. They were all made to be as an arbitrator also, or they were said they were all eligible to be an arbitrator or the restrictions were brought in in this manner. Now, if you see this, again, earlier, any person was there. Now, there's a specific restriction of 10 years experience. Interestingly, this particular schedule has now been repealed and it has been uh, removed from the Amendment Act 2021. And this was so because of the arbitration council which was to be formed and which was supposed to take over the entire process of appointing arbitrators and giving the qualifications of the arbitrators. So as on date, Schedule 8 is not in uh, practice and it has been expelled. Now we have known who are the persons who can be an arbitrator and what are their eligibilities have all we have seen it. Now we have to go to the next aspect of appointing these arbitrators to resolve our disputes. Now, who are the persons who can be appointed as arbitrators? And next aspect also we would like to see is how many number of arbitrators have to be included for resolving a dispute. Again, here the, schedule, the definition would say an arbitration tribunal maybe a sole arbitrator or three member arbitrators. There's another provision under section 10, which would say that an arbitrator cannot be in even number. So in other words, it was only the act, the statute would say that the arbitrator should always be in odd numbers and not in even numbers. However, there have been a few judicial precedents which have said that even an arbitration with even numbers is acceptable. Of course, they are with riders. 
in a dispute between in an uh, dispute with in, under the nsc arbitration bylaws the bombay high court had the single judge had in the initial sense said that uh, the judgment uh, award given by a uh, two arbitrators is not valid and it has to be set aside on appeal it was taken to the divisional bench of the mumbai high court itself and wherein it has been stated in stock exchange mumbai versus na ninay bona that it is an exception case because the rules of the national stock exchange by itself provides for two member arbitrator arbitration and therefore such an arbitration is valid in yet another case in narayan prasad lokya versus nikunj kumar lokya the supreme court had held that it is a process wherein when two arbitrators are appointed the parties have to object to the same under section 162 of the act if they fail to do the same section 4 of the act namely the waiver provision will be attracted and thereafter it will not be the option of one of the parties to challenge the award on the ground that there are only two arbitrators arbitrating the dispute so therefore what we come to understand is in case of a dispute which is resolved by two people two arbitrators the party ha- who have any objection to it have to raise it immediately stating that it is not as per the act and it is not as per the provisions of the act and therefore such a tribunal constitution is not valid and it has to be immediately challenged <clears throat> if the challenge does not take place at the right moment then they the party who wants to object to it cannot raise it at any time after now we were talking about how to appoint an arbitrator the section would again say that it is subject to the parties agreement so if parties were to agree what are the modalities in which a parties would agree to appoint an arbitrator first and foremost is mutual appointment they can mutually come together and say this such and such person will be the arbitrator they can appoint a third party to appoint they can ask a third party to appoint an arbitrator it can be an individual also they can name him or they can name a particular position now <clears throat> the person the third party should not be a related person to the one of parties in dispute <clears throat> in other words the third party should not be an employee or in direct management or in any way connected with one of the parties to the dispute such third party can be called upon and they can also be asked to appoint an arbitrator and the other best way is to name the arbitrator in the arbitration clause itself whereby in case of dispute it goes to the same arbitrator here again friends it's quite difficult to find a name and even the more is when the dispute comes in we need to know where this person is if he is out of reach or if subsequently there has been any contract between him and one of the parties then he again becomes ineligible under section 125 <clears throat> of the uh, arbitration conciliation act so therefore naming of arb- named arbitrator has its own uh, disadvantages also the next way of appointing an arbitrator is by the institution there are arbitration institutions which are framed only for the purpose of providing arbitration services cnica is one such institution where we provide for the appointment of arbitrator and to provide services of uh, arbitration services now with respect to unilateral arbitration appointment there are the most popular clause that one would see in all the agreements are <clears throat> the unilateral arbitration app- arbitrator appointment clause namely where one of the party is entitled to appoint an arbitrator this particular process, uh, process is not in not an against in any provisions of the act however in the recent judgment passed by the honorable supreme court in perkins eastman architects versus hs uh, hscc <clears throat> india it has been held that a person who is interested in the outcome of the award cannot be 
appointed as an arbitrator. Friends, we need to now see one important aspect here as to instead of saying that who can be appointed as an arbitrator, how to appoint an arbitrator, we can also now force to see who is to appoint the arbitrator. The question of the person who is appointing also his ineligibility has come into question now, which was never foreseen in the act. And to my knowledge, it has never been foreseen in any other arbitration act in the entire world. Now, the last option of appointing an arbitrator is by the court. Here too, it is only going to be academic. I'll give the reason why so. So the appointment of court, we will discuss in detail. When the parties to an agreement have a particular methodology of appointing an arbitrator, and they don't appoint an arbitrator in the set process, then they have to approach to the court. This trend was prior to 2019 amendment and to a great extent it still continues because that portion of the amended uh, act has not come into force. <clears throat> so as on date, the provisions of 2019 prior to 2019 is also made applicable. Namely, where the arbitrator is appointed by the court. Now in case of three member arbitration, the parties are requested to appoint each party to appoint one arbitrator, and they themselves appointing the presiding arbitrator. In case the two arbitrators also do not ag uh, agree upon, and the time is given as 30 days, if they don't agree within 30 days, then they are again asked to appear before the court and seek for an appointment of arbitrator. So the parties can approach to the Honorable Court and ask for an appointment of arbitrator. The High Court or as designate can appoint the arbitrator. Friends, after this 2019 amendment, Arbitration Council of India has been formed. And it is the duty of the Arbitration Council to form and grade arbitration institution. The Arbitration Institute Council of India shall collect the names of all the arbitration institutions in India and they will grade according to it and such graded arbitration center within the particular state shall be considered and they shall be designated by the High Court or the Supreme Court as the case may be. Why is it High Court or, or the Supreme Court is because in case of domestic arbitration it comes before the High Court and in case of the international arbitration, it goes to the Supreme Court. So therefore, the institutions now gain more importance. And once the grading and uh, designation by the High Court has been formed, thereafter, the arbitration appoint, arbitrator's appointment shall be made only by the institutions who are specifically graded and designated for this purpose. So friends, in going down the lane, the court's interference in the question of appointment is going to be reduced to a great extent. In fact, nullity. Even in case where the institutions are not appointing, then the parties are at liberty to go to another institution or the court where, where the court has designated some other institution. So thus, these are the process that one has to undergo to appoint the arbitrator. So friends, we have now seen who can be an arbitrator? Who can appoint an arbitrator? What are the process for appointing an arbitrator? We have also seen the different process by which through court we can appoint the arbitrator. Now that the arbitrator has been appointed, the first thing that an arbitrator has to do is to provide a disclosure statement. What is this disclosure statement? And why is this disclosure statement important? Section 12 would require that an arbitrator discloses, uh, gives a disclosure whether he has any doubts of his impartiality or is the <clears throat> impartiality in conducting the arbitration process. Friends, for this, one has to see what one vital information has to be seen, that is the acts which will constrain or which will bring him 
to the position that he cannot have a neutral judgment or where the circumstances that arises which constitutes his independence or impartiality. So section 2, 12 also provides for the provisions of the uh, provides for uh, the uh, um, form under which the said uh, declaration has to be made. Now I'll share with you all the said uh, declaration. Uh, is my uh, screen uh, visible? Yes, it's visible. Okay, thank you. Friends, this is the uh, form under which the disclosure has to be made. Now, two aspects are mentioned in section 12. One is with respect to the independence and impartiality, and the other with respect to the time frame by which the arbitrator can conclude his arbitration process. This is very important that we understand this distinction. My humble submission would be that most of the judgments rendered by the courts have not considered this vital aspect. One may look into section 121B. Friends, today I'm going to read this particular provision so that we can understand the exact meaning why this disclosure is being given. 121B reads, which are likely, if I read from the beginning, it will look like when a person is approached in connection with his possible appointment as an arbitrator, he shall disclose in writing any circumstances which are likely to affect his ability to devote sufficient time to the arbitration and in particular, his ability to compete, complete the entire arbitration within a period of 12 months. Friends, this is the purpose on which it has been brought in. The next aspect is, in the explanation one has to see, the grounds stated in fifth schedule shall guide in determining whether the circumstances exist which arise, which gives rise to a justifiable doubt as to the independence or impartiality of an arbitrator. Now, explanation two is the disclosure shall be made by such person in the form of specified in schedule six. Now, my friends, we need to see here that two aspects are there. One is the disclosure of independence and impartiality, and one is with respect to whether the arbitrator can complete the entire process within a time frame. And the third point is that Independence and impartiality has to be checked as a guideline under Schedule 5. Now, this becomes very important. Schedule 12, I'm sorry, Section 12.5 would say there is an ineligibility of all the conditions which are mentioned in Schedule 7. Now, with this light and thing in mind, we'll go through Schedule 6. And to a great extent, we will find that what is more important here is with respect to the disclosure, with respect to the time frame by which the arbitrator can complete, and also a disclosure under Schedule 5 being a guideline for determining whether he can be at fault. An arbitrator can be found to be uh, having a, uh, chances of impartiality. The first, the arbitrator has to give his name, his contact details, prior experience, including the experience with arbitration, number of ongoing arbitrations, <clears throat> circumstances disclosing any past or present relationship with or interest in any of the parties or in relation to the subject matter in dispute, whether financial, business, professional, or otherwise, which is likely to give rise to justifiable doubts as to your independence or impartiality list out. So the conditions which they are talking about is with respect to the portion where it is not considered to be ineligible to be an arbitrator. Only those considered aspects have to be disclosed here and not otherwise. And interestingly, in this disclosure of Schedule 5, one would not see that most of the cases where it has been relied on by our courts for 
considering this bias is mentioned anywhere. Next is important here. Circumstances which are likely to affect your ability to devote sufficient time to the arbitration and in particular your ability to finish the entire arbitration within 12 months. And if you have anything, you have to list out. So my friends, here the important aspect is the completion of the pro project and if you have any other aspects which would likely to be of any uh, hindrance to your independence or impartiality, you are required to mention it. <clears throat> so therefore, these, this important disclosure has to be the first act which an arbitrator has to do. This is a mandatory provision. There are many arbitrations where this particular provision is not followed and the courts have repeatedly held that such a uh, grave violation is opposed to the appointment and the arbitrator can be, uh, mandate can be changed for this reason. Next, my friend would be, after this would be the appointment hearing and the preliminary hearing. A preliminary hearing is very important hearing uh, procedure. Uh, running through the entire act, one would see that most of the provisions would read unless otherwise agreed by the parties, subject to the agreement of the parties. So the parties autonomy has been mentioned in length. Now, if the parties autonomy is given at most importance and the parties have ruled on every aspect of the arbitration procedure, then the preliminary hearing would not be of much importance. However, in practice, we don't find that every other aspect of the litigation process is agreed upon by the parties. The most of the cases we see only the arbitration process is agreed upon by the parties. Even that sometimes there is a gray area. So what is important in a preliminary hearing is we one has to again exhibit or enumerate all the end process by which they want to have the arbitration done. I have just formulated a small uh, preliminary hearing pro proceedings. This is only a format and uh, you can consider uh, for the purpose of understanding. You put the cost title, then the presence of the parties are mentioned, and then the proceedings, whatever proceedings is first hearing, second hearing, or preliminary hearing, whatever it is we mentioned there. Friends, I have purposefully scored out this particular portion. Earlier, we used to have it as date of reference for the purpose of section 29A. The 12 months period started from the date of reference. So what was the date of reference was always a question. We saw in the last session that the date of reference would be the date on which the reference letter is received by the respondent. Now here, what becomes important is when does the respondent receive the notice? So in such cases, this becomes very important as to when he receives. And from there, the 12 months is calculated. So it was also decided on the preliminary hearing itself, which will be the date of passing the uh, date of reference. And within 12 months will be the date on which the award is passed. So this is was a format which was being used. And now, of course, this will change because the date of completion of pleadings will be the date on, from which the 12, uh, 12 months period starts. Then the disclosure statement, in case if it is furnished along with the first hearing notice, we mention it here. If not, it has to be at least furnished before the to the parties in the preliminary hearing. And you can state what are the uh, what happened to the notices that were given to the parties, how uh, it was returned or received or have they appeared, and the vakalat entry. All these aspects can be brought in. And thereafter, we can draw an agenda of the entire proceedings, how it has to be made. The claim statement, statement of defense, when it is to be filed, documents, reply statement, rejoinders, if any, admission and denial of documents. In arbitration, this particular process of admission and denial of documents is very popular and is very convenient also. What happens in this procedure is an affidavit invariably is for filed denying or admitting the documents filed by the party, other party. Namely, the claimant will file an admission and denial of the documents which are filed by the respondent and vice versa, the respondent for the claimant documents. 
this narrows down the scope of litigation to the great extent wherever there is an admitted document parties need not go in depth and try to prove or their case with respect to the admitted document they can only concentrate on the denied documents this saves lot of time and energy and the next date of hearing is arrived at for framing of issues and with respect to the arbitrator's fee invariably it would not be possible at the preliminary hearing before the claim is filed to identify the arbitrator's fee so a tentative uh, method of identifying the fees can be made and the manner in which it has to be paid can be also recorded and the parties are required to be signed in these process now friends uh apart from this uh, pr proceedings preliminary hearing we need to also record certain other aspects namely how we want to conduct the evidence whether it has to be oral evidence documentary evidence if it can be arrived at at the preliminary hearing itself it is better we record the same similarly what language is to be uh the language of the arbitration if it has not already been agreed upon the venue where it has to be in case of international arbitration where the seat of the arbitrator is going to be in case of uh, third party evidence how they want to bring in third party evidence every other aspect can be agreed upon and recorded at the first instance itself once this is recorded at the first instance the major portion of the dispute does not arise arise at a subsequent period and the process can go through at ease no friends uh, now arbitration process com commences evidences are taken and uh, it uh, parties file their pleading and everything goes on what happens if one of the parties does not turn up or stays absent or does not file a uh, statement of defense or pleading or any of the so in such cases the arbitrator is required to proceed in the default of the parties as uh, the merits of the case and he need not wait or render his uh, uh, or abandon the entire process the tribunal also has given the power to appoint experts in the case of uh, documentation or uh, discovery of documents it can appoint experts for uh, the purpose of providing a particular answer to any technical issues so in case the tribunal on its own appoints an arbitrator i mean expert then the tribunal has to give the uh, parties the copies of the expert and experts uh, report and also allow the parties to examine the expert once the entire process is completed an award is passed i am not going to cover about the award and award writing or costing of the award and other aspects of it at this juncture i am going to push it to the so another process, uh, session where we will be covering most of these aspects now one important uh, question that arises here is when there are three arbitrators how will it uh, and they have different opinion what happens so in such cases the act provides that majority of the arbitrators shall view shall rule the award and the award will be based on the majority now with respect to the time limit which is also very important has to be considered the time limit mentioned in 29a as on date for domestic arbitration is 12 months and the said 12 months will commence from the date of completion of the pleadings and not before now one more interesting aspect or a, a higher tip is given to the arbitrator if he if the arbitrator completes the arbitration proceedings within 6 months in such cases the arbitrator is entitled to a higher remuneration similarly in case the arbit arbitration does not complete within the period of 12 months the parties can come together and agree to extend the arbitration proceedings for another 6 months but subsequent period has to be done only by the court friends when it goes to the court the court has the uh discretion to find out why the arbitration proceedings has been delaying who is causing the delay in case if it finds that one of the parties are default it can order cost to that party 
in case if it finds that the arbitrator opposed to his disclosure is unable to uh, complete the arbitration within a period of 12 months due to his lack of time then his fees can be reduced of course apart from all these the uh, arbit uh, the court also has the power to change the mandate of the arbitrator and appoint fresh arbitrator however the important aspect is that such an application has to be disposed of by the honorable high court within a period of 60 days now friends we that 60 days is only uh, though it says shall but it will be treated only as an obligatory aspect so with this today friends i have taken about 40 minutes for explaining who an arbitrator is what are the, the uh, how an arbitrator can be uh, appointed and how the proceedings can go on i welcome all of you all to uh, make this session more interactive now by your questions i am open open to questions now thank you if participants have any questions they can either post it in the chat box which i would read or they can use the raise hand option in zoom and i will unmute you all there's one question from ms abhirami nagarajan she asks what to do when a respondent objects to the appointment of an arbitrator in case of unilateral appointment of arbitrator for example in banking arbitrations you need to uh, change the mandate and approach the court if there are any more questions uh, please okay we, we have to see this in a larger perspective see uh, today the uh, after the perkins judgment as i told you all earlier the entire concept has been changed with respect to the unilateral arbitration so that uh, the entire issue now is an unilateral appointment is considered invalid so unless otherwise this judgment is ruled against or a different uh, larger bench gives another verdict today that becomes the law of the land and with respect to unilateral appointment their decision seems to have been shifted from the eligibility of an arbitrator to the eligibility of the appointing authority so this is not as i said envisaged under the act at all and this also interferes with the party autonomy and uh, in many contracts it is not possible for uh, other methodology excepting for unilateral arbitration arbitrator appointment for the purpose of time uh, uh, aspect because there are people who can who want to finish the arbitration at the earliest by going for mutually agreeable or institution the time might getting extended that is the reason why you be had a, a unilateral but however as on date the law is very clear with respect to this unilateral appointment is restricted there's one question from mr kartike varun i have unmuted him so good evening sir good evening karte uh, uh, it was a very very pleasant and uh, no the, the entire lecture was very very informative sir i just have one question uh, with regard to the declaration that you have mentioned sir yes. sir this uh, uh, procedural aspect will vitiate the arbitral award itself suppose the declaration is not followed and the arbitration proceedings went on and in section 34 if they raise a dispute saying that this particular mandatory procedure is not being followed will this vitiate the entire arbitral award or uh, what, to what extent this will be considered this is one question and yes. second uh, the named arbitrator we have named arbitrators in some of the arbitration agreements and uh, the uh, the moment they went and enter into an arbitration they don't give a declaration assuming that during the process of the arbitration agree agreement itself they have issued a declaration but the problem or issue persists dispute comes thereafter maybe after 3 years or 4 years then there is no declaration the named arbitrator uh, uh, just proceeds with the arbitration proceeding all of a sudden so what happens this time factor is is not being followed or the section is only saying that when you approach the arbitrator for the appointment process only then the section 12 comes into play not before the actual arbitration takes place so this is my second question of it okay first i'll uh, go through the uh, first question where you had asked about uh, sorry you had uh, just give me a hint of what you asked i must stop karthik you are muted karthik sir with regard to whether it will vitiate the the procedural aspect uh, declare ah, yes 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 uh, karthik now as you rightly said this is a procedural aspect but is it a mandatory aspect is now the question 
section 34 this is totally my opinion uh, 34 does not at any place say that uh, non disclosure will be a violation now we have also seen in one particular uh, judgment by the division bench of the mumbai court where there were two arbitrators the court held that you should have objected to it at the right point of time and not subsequently now this being both were mandatory provisions having a three uh, 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 arbitrators and uh, three uh, odd numbers as well as giving a disclosure is mandatory but though the giving giving of the disclosure is a procedure that has been followed here now when such a disclosure is not given it is left to the parties to immediately challenge under 12 because that is one of the grounds under cha of challenge which the parties can make at that point of time and if they miss their bus at that point of time my opinion would be that they cannot raise it at a later point of time section 4 would look at them and the waiver should be considered to be uh, done one more aspect is once they challenge it that is how 34 comes in the the section provides once they challenge it and thereafter an order which is not favorable to them has been passed they can still raise it as a ground before the uh, Arb uh honorable court under 34. so my uh, opinion would be that this is something which has to be raised at the right point of time if they miss to raise it then they lose their opportunity this is with respect to uh the procedural aspect the uh, another question was very interesting where the named arbitrator i actually when i was when i was referring to the named arbitrator i was specifically stating that there are the issues with respect to this uh, named arbitrator because his disclosure or his intention on the date of appointment would be different and on the date of appointment i mean date of his name inclusion in the agreement would be different and the date on which he was appointed would be completely different so and as you rightly said, the section also provides that the disclosure should be made at the time of appointment. We also saw the uh, format as provided under Schedule 6, which says two aspects are dealt with. One is the uh, aspect of his independence and uh, impartiality, and the other is with respect to the time constraint. With respect to the time constraint, it cannot be pre-seen at any point of time. It has to be seen at that point of time of his appointment. Similarly, his subsequent employment, his subsequent, subsequent interest in business or his financial commitment would definitely change his impartiality or he might be squarely applicable under Schedule 7. So in such cases also, it has to be treated only as an issue that arises on the, at the time of appointment and his disclosure should be given at the time of. I hope that answers your... Uh... Exactly, exactly. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Swarnavel Ramaswamy has one question. If in the agreement, if one party is entitled to appoint an arbitrator from their panel of arbitrators, does the other party, does the other party have any right to object such appointment or can the other party propose some other arbitrator? Sir, under the uh, present uh, Supreme Court ruling, right, likely they, uh, just as we were discussing in the earlier uh, question also, the Perkins case, uh, after that, the unilateral appointment from their panel is also objected to. However, there is another uh, schedule, schedules, I mean, uh, uh, provisions, section 12.5 and uh, the Redwood section, uh, schedule 7. It gives a provision that a panel is maintained by a customary, as a customary practice and as a tradition which is followed. And uh, arbitrator picked from that panel will be a valid appointment. This ha actually happens in many uh, marine uh, cases. Thank you. Is uh, the, Mr. Veda Bhagat Singh has one question. Is it mandatory to appoint arbitrators only from the Arbitration Council of India, whether the High Court is obliged to appoint from the Council or can the High Court appoint anyone? Now, after this uh, Arbitration Council of India comes in full-fledged, now it is in still in a working progress. Uh, they have uh, to come out with the uh, uh, grading of all the arbitra arbitration institutions. After they grade the arbitration institution, from there, it will be only the uh, duty of the High Court to designate the uh, institutions. 
and there from thereafter uh, the court will not have the uh, option of appointing an arbitrator at all in other words your application will be only to the uh, arbitration institutions so if there are any more questions you could post it on the chat box or you could raise your hand i guess that seems to be the end of the q and a session i would now like uh, to one second one second uh, i would also say that next uh, session i will be uh, addressing on the aspect of uh, uh, challenge to arbitrations and uh, with respect to uh, entry orders and uh, other related topics will be uh, uh, brought in uh, that session i would like to have it as a full fledged uh, interactive session first the team of uh, study circle team will have certain questions they will complete with their questions and then it will be open to the public uh, to all for their questions also it will be totally a uh, uh, interactive session uh, so i uh, uh, hopefully look forward for a great session next time and uh, i thanks study circle for again giving me this opportunity thank you we're very much looking forward to that session with that being said i would now like to invite mr siva shanmugam to give the vote of thanks he will give a sarcastic comment <laughs> <laughs> it's quite interesting a session uh, i think you have fairly covered the topic on arbitrator is appointment and uh, going through the questions you have also answered them well i hope the participants would be benefited through your lecture thank you and with regard to your third lecture uh, it's going to be question answer session i am bit wary about it I wish you all the best. I, I will. You. I will expect the best questions from you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know anything about much about arbitration. Thank you. Very assured Thank about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this should mark the end of the session. Thanks, the participants. <laughs>